Okay, now. Um, hi. Who here has used Rust? Anyone? Oh, that's a few numbers. And C for C++? Okay, good. At the end of this, I guess you will be yearning to use Rust, hopefully. Um, good. So this is the title of the talk. Um, browser engine for the 21st century. I have a tendency to like titles that are whatever for the 21st century. I already gave a talk about web audio, like tools for the 21st century musician. So it's kind of like a tendency. But the official name of Servo is what? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's the parallel browser engine, uh, which is designed for what applications and embedded use. Uh, and we will see all the points about this. This is the unofficial official logo. I think this is <laughs> not really working with this small. Okay. So yeah, this is very serious. Um, and the problem with many demos is that they are all like technical topics. Like they go for half an hour speaking about whatever, and you're like. But what is this thing? I want to see it in action. And that really annoys me. So I'm just going to do the opposite. And I'm going to show you Servo first. Um, so I'm going to show you Servo rendering, the Wikipedia main page. Um, and you launch it like this. So it just gets you like this little window. This is Servo. Um, so that's what Servo is doing right now. You can render Wikipedia, which is pretty amazing for a browser that was started like about three years ago. Um, it can render images. I don't think it can do audio, but maybe they added that the last week or something. Um, sometimes it's got bugs. Like, for example, if you keep scrolling, you get this white. <laughs> uh, but, you know, things happen sometimes. That's, that's in a browser which is under uh, development. So that's several. You can also click on things. It's, like, more complete than it, I make it look like. Um, it's got, you know, like, a bunch of things. that it passes, like it passes the ACID 1 test for CSS. It almost passes this ACID 2 test. I don't know if there is an ACID 3. Maybe there is. Um, but it's pretty OK. Um, so question that everyone's asking. Why is this not closing? Go away. Go away. It doesn't want to quit. OK, now, why are we doing a new browser? Because you know, if you're a web developer and you get told that you need to test in another browser, you're like, for fuck's sake, why? <laughs> <laughs> like, I already have issues. Like, for example, if you're running Macs, you cannot really test things in Windows easily without a virtual machine on the county. So it's like, why are we adding to this? Um, really, are there not enough browsers already? So let's go back to 1993. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee is way older. He's way, way younger than he is nowadays. And he makes this project, which is called the World Wide Web. This is the first website ever. And this is more or less how it would look like back in the days, except this is rendering Firefox or whatever. Um, this is how the first website looked like. And as you can see, it was very like designed for sharing documents, information, and it would have links so you could dig between pages. And it was very good for this kind of like, you know, like academical stuff. It was really good for that. Um, this was the first computer that ran this browser and it was also the first server so if you can see this label which is here it actually says this machine is a server please, please do not power it down because if you power this thing down you power it on the internet so obviously you don't want that so yeah this was Tim Berners-Lee computer in, in CERN in Switzerland I think um, and here's this book for scale but this was like a machine I think it was running on 32 megahertz or something just one core obviously um, so it could render this kind of things, which is okay for the time, but you know, things happen, time passed. We got different things <laughs> in the web, like Ajax, and we also got HTML5. We have like way more things that we could do before without plugins and that kind of thing. So everything was very interactive. It was amazing. And then suddenly iPhone 6 happened and all of, <laughs> they released this before, um, well, after I created the image. So suppose they don't have the headphones plug and it's a seven. Um, <laughs> So mobile happened, and then people really wanted to use the web on their go, but turns out that maybe that's not what the web was prepared for. Um, so there are new needs. There are new needs, and users want to be able to do, you know, like, happy things on the web, and they want to do it in a way that doesn't drain the whole battery, just like, um, And developers also would like to use HTML and CSS and that kind of things in their apps because it turns out that rendering text with HTML, once you know how to, you know, like, master CSS, is better than building your own text and layout engine in C or whatever you want to do. So people want to take browsers and put them into their apps, but that's not what browsers were 
like prepare thought. So it's really hard to do because browsers are not prepared for that. Um, and they also would not like to worry about C++ memory issues and you know like those little segmentation faults and that kind of things. So we have all these needs and we have the issue that most modern browsers were designed pre-year 2000 for desktop computers, so definitely not for a thing that is running on battery. And they're also written in C++, like lots of lines of C++. So we need, and this is the needs that Mozilla saw, we need to develop a browser that can cater for this kind of applications and also the devices. And it uses all the hardware in the machine, not just the CPU, which the back in the 90s, computers just had one CPU and no GPU. We need to make sure that we use all the hardware which is containing these mobile devices. And we also need to make sure that it's secure, so that means that it doesn't crash because the memory is like brr. Um, and we need to make sure that it's also modular, so we can take the browser, part of the browser, as we want, and use it in our apps. So that's why Servo was created. Servo is going to answer to all these issues, and maybe more, possibly. Um, but we're doing this by fixing one problem each time. One is making sure that the foundation is solid. You don't want to have very advanced and clever thing when the thing underneath is very crumbly. So the first thing we do is Rust, which is the language we've chosen for um, building Servo. And then we are making sure that we use all the hardware by using lots of parallelization. Um, if you've been in Martin's talk this morning, he was talking about WebGL and the way that WebGL is using all the units in a graphics card. So we're trying to do the same thing, not only with the WebGL uh, or, or the OpenGL uh, chipset in your device, but also using all the CPUs in the device. And also we want to make sure that servo or parts of servo are available by design. So this is what I'm going to talk today about. Um, so, regardless of the solid foundation, um, we have this interesting contrast between what users want and what it takes to build in programmer cost. They want high interactivity, so they can be scrolling and new tiles are loading in the map and they get notifications at the same time and they can, I don't know, like use GPS at the same time as well. So they want all that kind of things, which is um, a thing that requires multi-threading, but multi-threading is difficult to write in C++. Um, they also would like to be able to trust the browsers, so they would like to you know, do their banking and make sure that no one's going to hack them, but that means that you need to make sure that the code you're writing is safe and it's not going to dump a bunch of data and leave it in the hard drive for anyone to hack and see what's going on in there. The problem is that writing C++ code, that safe C++ code, is really hard. Um, so as I say, existing browsers have millions, like millions of lines of C and C++. And as an example, out of all the critical bugs that we have in Gecko, which is like the insights <coughs> of Firefox, half of those bugs are a consequence of using C++. Even if the programmer is like super experienced and has been programming even before C++ was invented, they are going to introduce bugs, even if they don't know it. At, in, in, at some point, it will happen. So the conclusion is that C++ is a li liability, and that's why we are moving away from, from C++. And any new code that you write nowadays, like even, for example, um, I think Hope, Hugh Rowlison mentioned web MIDI. We are not going to write web MIDI in Firefox using C++. We're writing that with Rust, because we want to make sure that that thing doesn't you know, like introduce future bugs. And the way that you avoid feature bugs is by using Rust because it's memory safe by design. So some things that you can do with C, like dangling pointers, data races, integral overflows, buffer overflows, iterating validations, you can't do that thing with Rust because it has either compiled or runtime checks. So if you try to do something that is trying to access a thing that has not been assigned or is going over the, you know, like the iteration and range or whatever, it's going to tell you, I'm sorry, but you can't compile this thing. And if you run the debug version, it's going to go and look and see like, oh, this is going to fail. So you can find lots of things before it gets to the user. And then the developers can be like delighted writing a, a super cool browser instead of being like, oh my god, I have another cementation fault. This is terrible. Um, the other cool thing is that you have a very easy way to do parallelism with Rust. With normal C or you know like even Python and any other types of uh, normal languages, writing parallel stuff is difficult. You have to partition your data and you have to make sure that you collect the data. So you have to think a lot about that. But Rust makes it easy because the default library and the and the the way the language is designed, you it makes it very easy for you to just like give it 
um, data and it will just like partition things for you. So you don't need to do it and you can just um, kind of like replace primitives with others and everything goes really, really parallel and nice for you. Um, it also uses this new concept, which is lending references. So you don't access the same object. You kind of like lend access to the object to other thread. So there's no way that two things are manipulating the same thing at the same time. Um, this is similar, like you don't send the object by using messages. So it's a way to not to have data races because by design you can't. <laughs> so it, it's like a very kind of like, as I say, foolproof, like you can't really mess it because it just won't let you compile it. And the other interesting bit is that it tries to be as fast or faster than C. Um, and when, I, when we say faster, we mean like literally faster software, but also faster developers because it's fast by, by default. You don't need to be clever, which is also synonym for buggy maybe in the future, because when the clever person leaves the team, someone has to fix the thing or like update that, and you know that's going to introduce some bug at some point. So when things are fast by default, they are very clear. It's like um, you don't have to think about what the syntax means because it's very obvious. And so if you don't have to spend time debugging, you can develop for longer. <laughs> and the other cool thing is that it's interpretable with C. So you can use things that already exist. You don't need to rewrite everything if you want to write a new thing with Rust. So for example, with Servo, we are using SpyMonkey, which is the JavaScript engine from Firefox. So we didn't have to write that thing from scratch. Uh, in order to have a browser that knows how to run JavaScript. So maybe in the future, when we finish with the old things, we can write a new JavaScript engine, which is all written with Rust. But for now, we can use the Firefox one because it's got a C interface as well. And the other cool thing is that it's got a package manager. So if you are an, a JavaScript developer and you use NPM, you're kind of spoiled because you can have the parentheses, which are version, and you can reproduce the builds, more or less. Um, which compared to traditional C or C++ programming is kind of hard because suppose you want to develop something in Linux and you have to install the library, then the library dash dev, and then maybe standard live, and then hope that something works. So with Carol, you avoid all that. So you have binaries with dependencies and you make sure that the thing works. So that's, that's all cool. So that's problem number one, solve. We, we have Rust and it's all great. And the second problem is maximizing usage of power. But in this case, just to render websites, I'm not going to talk about other things. But here's the interesting thing. How does a browser render websites? Does people know how browsers render websites? It's super interesting. I'm not going to go super in detail. This is a very, hopefully not too gross, simplification. A simplification. Um, I'm trying that because there is often the purist that comes and says, like, excuse me, but actually, this is not how it works. <laughs> so just in case, this is simplified, so you get a little bit of the idea of how it works. So you follow me. So suppose we have this bit of code that we want to render. So we have some paragraphs, a div, span, and some simple rules. So more or less, this is what we want to get into the screen. So first thing the browser does is it will take that HTML code and convert that into a DOM tree. Easy. That's pretty easy. Um, then we go and try to find styles per node. And even if they show like one under the other and then with the span. That's not exactly how the browser is having that. It's, it's just like, it has nodes, but they're not like, like in that position or anything. They're just there. So we're trying to get some basic styles like colors and basic size and inheritance. So we're using some of the cascade already. So the first thing it does is like, okay, the body has a font size of 100 pixels. So we go from here to there. So we use that rule. Next, the color is red. Next, the span is half the size. Okay, so we have some styles in the nodes. Um, then we construct the flows and the fragments. The fragments are the leaves, in this case are the end of the tree, and the flows are containers or formatting context. You might have heard that when you're trying to find where there are like white spaces between your things and your HTML. So we, we find this thing, and we do this thing going from bottom up. It is important. Um, so we need to go at the end, do, 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 and we kind of like emerge at the end. Next. This is the same thing, but with the thing that we rendered before. We are still going from bottom up. Next, we need to bubble the inline size. This is when the elements say, this is my minimum size, so please take this into account. So we found the size of this, of this, of this, and then evidently, this is the node size. Okay, we did this in bottom up as well. Now we need to go from top to down. So what we do is we find the size of the containers, but also using the size of the parent. 
So there is kind of like, a, you know, like you have this thing where you say, okay, my maximum is going to be this. So the, if you have children inside, they have to adjust, that kind of thing. So that's what we do now. And then, well, the minimum was 10 pixels. So this is perfectly fine for 645. Now, block size, this is for finding the height. So again, it depends on the children height. So now we're going bottom up as well. As well. And then finally, after going all these uh, traversals, we find a display list, or we build a display list, which is what we eventually will give to the renderer, whatever the render it is. Um, so this is Christ, but it should be displayed on the screen. So this is what browsers do, essentially. I just show you the under the hood things that browsers do. Um, so normally, all these uh, arrows up and down is like, the traversals and things that are going on. Um, so even if they look like pilot here, they used to have a model like this. So that means that if you have lots of nodes, every of those steps kind of like starts taking longer. Um, and, and that's acceptable in the 90s. I don't know if someone knows the song. <laughs> um, but it's not acceptable in mobile anymore because uh, mobile processors are not like desktop processors. Um, they are very slow, but they have many cores. So if you just put everything in just one core, everything's going to go, go really slow. But this is interesting. If you parallelize things and you have more cores working at the same time, but a slower frequency, you can get the same performance as one core, but using 40% of the energy. So that's really interesting because you will have like longer battery usage. Um, so also, if you make sure that things are in parallel, you can compute lots of three nodes at the same time and faster, even in, if in, sorry, in all platforms, it doesn't need to be mobile. So it's interesting to parallelize. Uh, so server does lay out in parallel. Um, not exactly like this. It could be that some traversals are happening at the same time. It doesn't need to be in this order because some of the traversals don't need to wait for the previous traversal. So, an example of an idea of how it could work is you have this tree and you could split the work. So one CPU does one bit of the work and the other does this other bit. But the interesting key here is that it's not just like that. They use this work stealing algorithm, which means that every thread, which is like a processor, will have a queue of works they have to complete. But if one thread finishes early, it can steal job from the other threads. Just kind of like super sneaky. So in principle, it could be like you have these two trees, and CPU number two discovers that this node is set as display node, which means that there's nothing to do with the rest of this because nothing of this should be rendered. So it's like, okay, I'm done with this. I'm going to steal this job from you. And eventually ends up that this other CPU ends helping CPU number one to render this bit. So it is very interesting because um, if you try to do parallelism the user way, you would just like upfront split all the jobs distribute them and it could happen that some of the CPUs were like waiting for something to finish because they have no new jobs. In this case it's way more dynamic so you can make you know like it's more adaptable at the circumstances and things. And there are all optimizations like this thing called incremental layout. It will try to minimize calculations. So for example it's got this damage flag on each node and it will make sure that the changes that the CSS property applies doesn't invalidate too much. So for example, if you change the color, it doesn't change the position of the size. So you can just update a little bit of the display list. You don't need to recalculate everything that's hanging from there. So that's, that's a bit of the things that Servo is doing to like go faster. Um, but that's only for building the layout, not how rendering it. And that's where OpenGL uh, gets into. Um, we have this render, which is called Web Render. It's just a little bit like, a year and two months old, which is very impressive. It was started in September of last year, and it's totally based on OpenGL, and it just renders CSS content. Every canvas thing and everything is still running the CPU, but this bit is rendering CSS super fast on the GPU. So what happens is that painting is super, super fast. And again, why do you do a new render? There is Skia, there is Cairo from, uh, from Mozilla as well. So the problem is that those renders are general purpose renders, which are great if you want to do like text and canvas stuff and things. But they are designed for CPUs, they're not designed for GPUs. So as Martin was explaining this morning, which was like really great, because like, oh, I don't need to explain this to myself. Um, mm -hmm. They are doing lots of things in, in like that can stall your processor, whereas the, CPU, the GPU works in a different way. You just give it things, and it just paints the things. Um, so web render is going to simplify your website so that it looks like a few small number of primitives that can render really quickly. 
Um, so as a developer, what this means for you as a developer is that you can just declare layout and you don't have to worry about if that thing is going to trigger layout or, you know, you know, the kind of things that we need to worry about, like, is this going to <coughs> get its long, on, la on layer? Do I need to use transform set, zero? That kind of weird things that is like, I don't know what I'm doing. I would just like to put things on stage and using the CSS thing. So in a nutshell, what it does is it uses the display list that we generated at the end of the layout step and it draws into an OpenGL context. Pretty much every device we have nowadays can do a proper OpenGL context. But the minimum is to one or OpenGL 3 for desktop. ES is for embedded devices, so mobile phones. And it uses retain mode, which means that it's not uploading things to the graphics card all the time. And it's basically like a graphics engine. If you've done any graphics engine programming, uh, you might recognize many of these concepts. So how it works, it takes this list, which is something like this, and it has just a few number of primitives. So it's got text, solid color, box, shadow, whatever. Um, and then it prepares the resources. The glyphs, which is the text, they are um, uploaded as textures, like the textures that Martin was explaining this morning. And the images, again, uploaded as textures. When we say upload, we don't mean to the web, we mean to the, to the, to the graphics card. And then paths and shadows are rendered with a special shaders, but the cool thing is that this is very fast because, you know, like graphic um, cards have lots of units to do this thing. And these things, with these resources that we prepare are retained from frame to frame, which means that you just need to upload it once, and unless you change the text or the textures or sorry, of the images are invalidated, it, you don't need to do that every time. And then you just need to draw as many times as you want. Conclusion, you say goodbye to a transform set. You don't need to give elements or accelerator layer because everything is a layer now. <laughs> and then you don't need to use transform translate instead of using top and left because top and left is going to trigger layout. You just can use whatever you want to use that makes sense. And it's not like translate set and whatever because this is very, that's very strange. Um, so you can also say goodbye to painting as the bottleneck. You don't need to be like, oh my God, I just have 60 milliseconds. I can just, no, no. Goodbye to junk as well. You can just like, Right, CSS, like relax, just relax. <laughs> so you can say hello to hundreds of frames per second. The problem is that computers normally just render 60 frames per second, but you could draw hundreds. Um, we are using this GPU effectively. We are actually using it for, for reals. And the other good thing is that GPUs tend to be really optimized. So you get better energy consumption, which is great for mobiles. And if you are really brave, maybe you could even use web render if you are able to describe your graphics with CSS. So you can use that in your own app. Um, so demos, again, I'm going to show them in Firefox and then in Servo so you can see the difference. And my computer is not very fast. This is 1.3 gigahertz. It's very lightweight, but really slow. So it's not super impressive. So this one is a thingy that will draw mosaics with colors. So it's like, ah, and then, it's kind of like painful to watch. And then the same one with servo. I think it's somewhere here. Are you ready for the speed? <laughs> uh, servo doesn't have sound yet, so I have to do it myself. <laughs> I was super excited when I started to work with servo. I was like, I can't do something. No, I can't. So it was very disappointing. Actually, this demo was built by Sam Booth, which was my intern this year. And he built a lot of all the cool demos. So all credits to him. Um, Sam is great. Um, and then there is this other demo, which is, this is the one I brought. Uh, it's about displaying as many doggies as you can, and then just show a counter. So this was really cool, because people were taking pictures of as many doggies they could get on their offices, computers and things. And I was really excited. I was like, everyone's showing doggies on the screen. This is really cool. This is working really great now because we are not using retina resolution because we're using the um, projector resolution. So we are like, ah, it's starting to go down now. Um, normally when I have like, the retina, this is like double resolution. So this is kind of like struggling, but now it's working really nicely. Um, it's just slowly going down, slowly. Um, and the same one in... In, it's a smoother, that's the thing. The problem is that canvas is not totally, so the numbers are missing. <laughs> but you can see that it's like really, really. Um, yeah, so this is my, this is what I do. Um, 
So, so that's what render. That was render in action. Um, I think they switch it on by default. If you get servo, it's the default render. Before they were using a, another render, which wasn't as fast. So this is really promising. Um, so yeah, we have fast layout. We are using the hardware properly. This is great. But while we're embedding, um, it's designed to be embedded, and you can take as many parts of servo as you like. You can take a few components or the whole thing. Um, the way it works is that it's just in the package manager. So instead of being, I don't know if you've tried to compile, I don't know about Chrome, but I can tell you for sure that downloading the code for Firefox takes time. And it's like the repository. It's like the repository where everything goes to die. So it's like, it takes hours to download. And, uh, um, but in contrast, uh, Servo is like a lot of repositories. So when you check out the code, it downloads the first Git repository. And when you start um, the build process, it will just pull data from other repositories because it uses packages from the ecosystem. And not only it uses packages from the ecosystem, but also contributes packages back to it, which is very interesting, as we'll show you later. And also the other cool thing about things being packaged is that it's harder to make things couple as we have in five, like things that kind of couple and you want to replace something, it takes time. But because you're, you're using something that has a very defined boundary, it's harder to go and fall into that trap. So it's like a more modern browser. That's why this, I, I think that this is more of a 21st century way of programming. So because it's designed to be embedded, it's got like a stable boundary and exposes, again, a C interface. Um, so if, suppose you're a TV builder and you want to build a mobile UI, this is a good thing for you to use because it uses few energy, which means that you can have a cheaper processor. So you can embed cheaper stuff in your TV and the profit, is, profit margin is going to be bigger. So this is great. Um, so you have new types of applications you could build. I have no idea what because I am not building these kind of things. But <laughs> if you are into this business, you, I'm pretty sure you want to be able to run something that has HTML support and JavaScript and CSS, but doesn't consume much energy, which is, tends to be like most of the devices we want to use. So here's it for everyone to use. So feature, is this emoji acceptable? I don't know. Um, when can we use Servo as our main browser? Um, so the first answer would be never, <laughs> because it's not, a browser is just the engine, but people get really disappointed, so I need to change something. It's like, okay, today, um, with this thing called oxidation, uh, oxidation, you know, you, you've seen that the logo is like that dog with the rust called thingy. Um, so they are playing games of that, and I don't really get it, but whatever, they call it oxidation, um, which means that we are taking bits of rust or packages from servo, and we are bringing them into Firefox. So you don't need to wait until the server is complete and all the features are implemented to use those. So for example, this is already live since August. If you're running Firefox in an updated version, the, like the, the videos, the metadata um, data in videos for MP4s is already been running fast code <laughs> since August. And maybe in the future, we are also going to use the URL parsing. Um, this is a very interesting thing. There are so many libraries and node modules for packaging URLs. <laughs> so it, it's very interesting that the browser shares with you the same library they are using. So you don't need to write again the URL parsing library because <coughs> this is the source of so many buffer overflows. Like it's amazing the amounts of time the hackers bring browsers to a crash, but it gives you bad URLs. So if you can give me something that is really safe, we are like protecting users. Um, the CSS style calculation is another bit that we want to uh, maybe swap. <coughs> and then maybe this thing as well, like videos tend to happen a lot on the web lately. <laughs> so everything we can do to make faster, that's great. And who knows what else? I'm, I'm probably not able to tell you. So suppose, I don't know. Um, so community, this is very important. And I think that's a big part of the success of why server is going really fast and great. They have really high standards. Like if you go to the Rust web page, they have this code of conduct really up and clearly. Um, they will tell to people like, that thing you say was really gross. Please don't say that thing again. So it's not like you have to be like, oh, it's really upfront. And also they are in GitHub instead of being hidden in your own proprietary bug system. They are in GitHub, so where people are. So collaborating with getting started really quickly. The other cool thing they do is they label bugs by difficulty and the difficulty is quite actually accurate. It's not like, this is a good first bug and you're gonna, you're like, 
what? What do I do here? I don't even know. So they don't not only do that thing, but they also have very good bug descriptions, which I'll show you. Um, the other cool thing they do is they really quickly look into the things you file. So it's not like you file something and three years later someone is like, no response closing. And it's like, no one told me anything. I was waiting for you. Um, so it, you can feel that there is someone on the other side. So that's really exciting. And the other interesting thing, I think, is that they have lots of bots for things that should be automated, like white space corrections and nits and picks like that. So there is no emotions. It's like just like you're not complying with this. Please try again. So humans can do the interesting work, which is like doing proper code reviews. Um, the other thing that I think is really cool is they have this weekly blog post where they are like, this is what we did last week or this month or whatever. This is what this new person did, which was really great, la 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 la. And in general, they have really nice people. Like, it makes such a difference when you don't have like super rock stars in a project. And it's more like, oh, I see you're trying to do this thing. Oh, this is why. And they give you a link to the appropriate part of the HTML standard that explains about what you think is a bug, it's not actually a bug, it's actually a feature. So you're like, <laughs> okay. That's okay. So at least you come up with something that you learned. There's not just like, no, close, bomb, fix. Like, I was trying to help you. Um, so this is an example of uh, the blog that they, they write. So for example, they are like, we landed this. We are sorry that these things were down. So you accept the mess you're creating. You're not pretending to be perfect. Um, someone has become a reviewer, la, 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 publish the roadmap. So you can see what's up. And it's not just like, this obscure group of people in the pinnacle of the tower deciding the future of Cerebro. No, this is the community thing. And this is an example of bug. This is amazing. If you want to be like a contributor, you go here and you're like, oh, maybe I could do this thing. It's easy. Oh, so I need to copy this and then this. And oh, okay. So I need to edit this and this and this. And you can go and start trying things instead of having to go to an IRC channel and be like, hi, I would like to work on this. Can you help me? And no one's online because it's super late and you're on the other side of the world or whatever. So this is a very good way of getting new contributors on board. Even if they don't really know where to start, you're telling them where to start. So there's no way of getting lost. Um, so recap, uh, tackling problems one at a time, Rust, using hardware better, um, more embedding, and the future, oxidation. And then community buildings, community buildings, community building efforts. Um, are important, um, especially when you're an open source company, uh, project, whatever we are, um, you can't just put more developers on it or just like pour more developers, kind of like if it was money, uh, like Google can do. We can't do that thing because we are just way smaller. Um, so if you build a nice community, you are going to have a nice result. And then this is the best slide ever. If you want to know things, you can go to Servo or, or Servo Dev. If you want to ask questions, actually ask them the questions because they know better than I do. Um, they have nightly builds. You can download them. Like up until recently, you had to compile everything. But since July, I think, you can download nightly builds for uh, Windows, Linux, Mac OS. I think Android is in the works. This also runs in Android, but it's a bit, mm. so if you're a good Android programmer, we would love your help. Um, and, and a very easy way to contribute is just filing issues if your website doesn't work. There is a warning that says, please don't use this with your bank website, just in case. Um, <laughs> but everything else kind of works, um, although there are ways to make it crash. Um, you can also compile from source. <coughs> this is one of the few projects that actually compiles when you follow the instructions, which is really <laughs> amazing if you ask me. Like the amount of projects that you're like, oh, just, no, what should I do? I don't know. Um, so this is really, really, Impressive. Um, I don't know, it's really, really interesting. Um, I, I just can't resist showing you the thing that makes it crash because the, the crash patch is so nice. And <laughs> it makes you want to hug it and be like, I'm so sorry, I didn't want to make you crash. Uh, what is it? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It will eventually show up. Okay, whatever, just give me this. Um, this is our website that uh, my intern may build. Um, this is a particular demo that always crashes, and I'm going to show you because I want you to see how sad server looks. So the idea of this is that you have this kind of like website full of shit, and eventually <laughs> you click read view and it just like transforms and removes all the things. The, but the problem is that this is crashing right now. So it kind of does something, and eventually, oh, 
<laughs> so you're like, I'm so sorry. I will just find the issue and wait for the best. So and I like this is about failure. <laughs> it's, it's it's so genuine. It's like, nice. Okay, it's fine. I take it. So it's pretty sweet. And then so obviously I had to finish with something like this, like search browser, <laughs> many parallel for GPU. Wow. Um, yeah. This was my summer. It was like a really cool summer, looking at doggies <laughs> all the time. So thank you. <laughs> I don't know if we have time for questions. Are we done? Uh, I'm sorry that we don't. We can get you down. Here. That's perfect. That's perfect. I don't like questions anyway. Oh, cool. So. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> about what is potentially wrong with computer science, security, and probably computers. Is that fair? Stay here. But if you really care about email, I would go upstairs as quickly as